good morning. Uh, it's Thursday, June 11th. It's 10 o'clock, and this is a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Um, we have been working this uh, week and last on uh, a variety of Act 250 provisions as they arise, and I think it's we're up to five different bills. We'll be knitting things together uh, and to one amendment that will be brought forward to uh, the housing bill, S-237. So uh, it's a little hard to track all the pieces, uh, even if you're on the committee, but I just, that's, that's what we're doing. So we have, today we're uh, revisiting uh, features related to Act 250 planning and development as they uh, are expressed in S-237. And uh, we're, we've, uh, wanted to hear from folks uh, and go through those uh, questions again. Um, the other thing is, let me check in with uh, our council, Ms. Joukowsky. Um, I don't, many days you've had some material that you wanted to share at the outset to tee things up. Uh, we didn't discuss doing that for today, but you're so diligent. You might have something I'm not aware of. Is there anything you wanted to share with us before we, uh, go to our uh, our witnesses today? No. Okay, then we're good to go. So thanks again, everyone, for uh, uh, joining us. Uh, again, so 237 uh, is three quarters of it relates to uh, municipal planning and zoning. Uh, and those are, we work in both titles 10 and 24. So we're very interested in hearing from you all uh, about the, your assessment of how helpful or maybe occasionally unhelpful some of those provisions are. Um, we've, as individual senators, uh, been receiving feedback, I think, from our, uh, some local folks. So we're going to be visiting with a variety of people today. And uh, we're short on time, so I'm going to stop with the preamble and jump right to uh, uh, Karen Horn. If I don't see her yet in the room. Okay, so uh, she may be in the process of connecting with us. Let's we'll change up the batting order a little bit and just move on then. To, right, she isn't uh, here yet. Okay, so we'll move on to Jen Holler. Good morning, Ms. Holler. Um, so good morning. We'd love to. We're gonna. We'll we'll catch up with Karen Horn when she gets here. But meanwhile, we'd love to hear from you on the bill. Thanks. Okay, I'm just pulling up my notes. You uh, surprised me with the, uh, the change in the batting order here. <laughs> this is a little like cooking some days. It's like we have six okay. burners going and we're pulling Karen things on. <laughs> Senator Bray, Karen has joined us. Okay. So let's continue with Jen since she's teed up and ready to go and then we'll go back to Karen. Okay. Good morning, my name is uh, Jen Holler. I'm the policy director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And um, uh, VHCB appeared before you earlier in the session um, during some of your, your Act 250 discussions. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here um, today to speak in support of S-237 and in general, um, the deliberations that your committee has been um, undertaking. Um, I, as I, uh, I haven't been able to listen to all the uh, discussion, but it seems that you're really working to achieve some balance in the bill um, and maybe adding more balance to it. And I think that that makes a, an awful lot of sense. Of course, VHCB is sort of the state's um, funding arm for uh, um, supporting the goals that are embedded in the regulatory structure of Act 250. And of course, we've long been about the business of balancing housing and conservation and questions around land use and where it makes sense to develop and where it's important to uh, protect and keep things um, open. So um, what I'd like to speak to specifically today are some provisions that are in S-237 that we feel like do achieve some balance and that are very important um, to preserve. And uh, specifically that relates to the uh, exemption for um, from Act 250 for um, certain designated areas. 
And we um, and sort of the housing community generally feel like that makes sense. Um, that's where we want development to happen. Um, it's where infrastructure is, it's where services, transportation, and for many, many other reasons that that makes sense. Um, unfortunately, uh, a blanket exemption for uh, downtowns and neighborhood development areas would have the unintended consequence of losing an existing incentive in Act 250 for developers to include affordable housing, um, at least some number uh, um, of units within their um, buildings or their neighborhoods. And so there, uh, there was um, concern among, uh, on our part and others um, led by the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition around the loss of that incentive if the blanket mm -hmm. exemption was adopted. So that concern was brought to um, the administration. We worked with Chris Cochran, who you'll hear from later, and others. Um, in consultation with VNRC and others who really know this area of law really well. And eventually um, we're able to work through an agreement that um, we believe uh, meets the objectives around the exemption for, um, for these areas while still ensuring that there are meaningful mechanisms for communities to provide for and allow housing that's affordable to all people of all incomes. Um, we know now more than ever that that's incredibly important um, to provide for affordable housing in these areas and that making sure people have housing options, there are housing options that people of all incomes and backgrounds and circumstances can afford is one of the most important ways to make sure our communities are inclusive and diverse. Um, the designation programs that the state has are really powerful, um, are, work really well. As we look to um, communities across the country and how they, similar types of programs have played out, sometimes the caution we've heard is that they've worked so well that we didn't make, um, that people of lower income, there's been investment and development brought to these areas, um, but it sometimes has the effect of pushing people out. It can, it can lead to some gentrification and it can, um, it can have the effect of pushing lower income households um, outside community centers and, and, and to the outskirts. And so we don't wanna undo something that we already have um, in the attempt to gain something more that we want. So essentially um, we feel like we've reached a, a good sort of solution with the administration and others around the exemption and that the, um, the offset to that is if you lose that incentive for developers, what you could do is make sure that through the designation process, um, communities must include uh, meaningful mechanisms for ensuring that they allow for um, and provide for a range of housing types and um, levels of affordability in their communities. So the language before you in S-237 includes that. Um, as your committee likely knows better than just about anyone, this is a complicated area of law. And if you start to pull a thread in one place, it can quickly unravel something important elsewhere. So it took a while to get all this worked out and it was, um, did not, the agreement did not come in time for it to be included in H926. Because there are um, related um, provisions around zoning and um, the Act 250 exemption was in S237, um, the compromise language was um, offered there and adopted by um, Senate Economic Development. So I just want to make sure that we all uh, are referring to the same document and I'll ask Mr. Kowski to double check. And the version that I'm referring to for the, and the committee has sort of been using as its base document for S-237 was draft 9.1 voted out on March 11th. And I, I think that's, so I want to make sure that when you're saying the current version is uh, satisfies addresses those concerns you have, that that I'm looking at a version that includes the language that you're sort of signing off on, and I don't know if there was ever a draft, uh, Ms. Chikowski, after draft nine point one. So uh, we can. Do you know so, uh, draft 9.1 is what Senate Economic Development recommended. Okay. Um, the provisions uh, related to affordable housing that Jen was just talking about are in it. 
since then, not to complicate things further, Senate Finance has added a um, small, two small technical amendments that don't have to do with this specific, uh, specific topic. Okay, great. Um, maybe you could send them to us just so we're aware of them, not that we're gonna edit finances work, but just so we know what's getting assembled into the bill that will eventually hit the floor. Thank you. All right, uh, Senator Campion. Thanks. So uh, just, I think a similar question along those lines. So Ms. Hollard, what we have in front of us right now, you're not looking for any changes, uh, right? These are, everything was done uh, either in economic development or is being done uh, as a floor amendment by economic development? We support the, the language that's in 9.1 in front of you and the um, amendments um, crafted by Senate Finance um, don't um, make any changes to those specifics. Okay. I know your time oh. is short and- Right, um, so for our committee, I mean, are there things that you're looking uh, for from our committee? I'm sorry for, or is that just the, the overview? Is that what you're providing us with? Just endorsing I've, and done. I'm endorsing it. I'm saying that it's a delicate balance. I hope it can yep. be preserved. Um, I know that you're going to hear later testimony where there may be some suggestions for changes in those areas. Uh -huh. I say to you that once again, sort of once you pull a thread somewhere, it's going to undo something else. And um, I won't get into all the details right now because I know your time is short, but I just urge you to preserve that um, that balance that we think is there. Okay. From the ACB's perspective, I would go on to say we really are encouraged to hear your discussions of trying to make progress on the trails question. We see that those uncertainties interfering with some of the outdoor recreation projects that we'd like to be able to fund. Um, and that also around um, adding additional protections for important areas outside of downtowns and our developed areas makes an awful lot of sense from our perspective. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, our goal always is this sort of fair balanced approach and we know what, what is balanced to one person might seem like imbalanced to others. So <laughs> we'll keep working and I'll ask everyone who's here to keep an eye on what conclusions we end up drawing and what kind of amendment we move forward to make sure that uh, although there may be changes, you still believe that we haven't made any uh, you know, critical quote unquote errors that seem to unbalance something of uh, importance to you. And with that, uh, thank you very much for coming in. We're going to move along in a pretty good clip today. I'd like to turn next to um, Ms. Horn. Karen Horn, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I just uh, sent Jude a, a few minutes ago a revised set of testimony that touches on a bunch of different elements in S237 draft 9.1, uh, and I just pulled up draft 9.1 again. Um, so the we have a number of concerns around S237, the way that it came from the Senate Economic Development Committee. We're very interested in the, the issues that have been raised in that bill and very supportive of, of them generally. Some of our concerns are really around how the language manifests in, in this draft. Um, we would ask you to reconsider language in um, section one that requires a municipal map to include water supply and sewer disposal lines, facilities, and service areas, uh, or amend it to say that that information is required if available. Around the state, we have a number of towns that don't have those kinds of maps, and they would be incredibly expensive to put together. Some of the service lines in particular for wastewater, as you know, are, um, are more than 100 years old. So uh, mapping them all is, is going to be difficult. We would ask you to delete the new language in section two which is 24 VSA section 4412. Um, and it has to do with mandates for, for uh, inclusionary zoning for housing. Um, we think that really what needs to happen is uh, there needs to be encouragement on those kinds of issues. Municipal zoning is not the only uh, problem 
that is an impediment to, uh, to municipal housing. And we would ask you to add language that calls on the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to report on the progress of the Zoning for Great Neighborhoods project that they've conducted with assistance from the CNU Project for Code Reform. And I believe Chris Cochran can talk to you a little bit about what is entailed there, but it was really a demonstration project to help towns um, figure out what works best in their communities. We are concerned about section 10 in the uh, bill, sorry, which Karen, is the, let me, yeah. uh, Have you sent the requested for any of the, well, just in general, and I'll say this to everyone, uh, so for any kind of language change that you would like us to consider, um, it would be great if you may have already done this. I apologize if I just have not seen it yet. Um, to submit any requested language changes in writing ASAP so that we can, uh, one, get them up on our website, and two, that we'll know precisely uh, what it is that is of concern and how it might be adjusted. So sorry for that interruption. And Senator Campion. Thanks. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention that would be helpful uh, is when speaking about changes, if people could let us know whether or not they proposed these changes in economic development and they were rejected, or if these are requests that folks thought of after the bill uh, went through, you know, time is tight. Um, it'll help us with regards to whether or not we need to loop back to Senator Sorokin. I mean, we will be looping back to Senator Sorokin, but just to give us some context for whether or not some of these have been vetted and already rejected, that would just be very helpful. Certainly. Uh, sorry you. about that. Uh, no, no, you no, no, did no. just post our testimony on the on your website, and it does include some specific language amendments because Senator Bray had asked me for those um, when when he first invited me to testify. And secondly, I would say that we did raise all of these issues in the Senate Economic Development Committee. We didn't. Um, provide specific language, uh, for instance, on section 10, but we did um, raise all of these issues and ask for the committee to take a more um, incentive-based approach versus mandating um, additional provisions in chapter 117, the planning laws and in, and in uh, Act 250. We do support, um, strongly support the exemption from Act 250 for designated downtowns. Um, we think that's appropriate. A lot of that, uh, a lot of projects in designated downtowns are already exempt from Act 250 because of their size. And um, I would recommend that you might want to take a look at the provisions that you have to comply with in order to get a designated downtown designation. It's very comprehensive. A lot of work and money has gone into um, putting together applications and plans for designated downtowns. So uh, with that, can, it, yeah. does that help Senator Campion? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Very much so. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, I think when I interrupted you three minutes ago, well, you were moving on to section 10. So I don't know. I don't want to miss something. Right. Okay. So in, in section 10, we're, we're very concerned about some of the provisions that, um, the, that were put into that in particular, like having to set up a housing commission as one of the options. Um, really, uh, a lot of municipalities are dealing with a lot of volunteers and a host of committees and issues. And we do think that that um, would be very difficult requirement to fulfill. So we do recommend that the language be amended to say a housing element in its plan in accordance with subdivision 4382, this is in the bill already, um, that achieves the purposes of subdivision 4302 sub 11 of this title and includes clear implementation steps for achieving mixed income housing, including affordable housing timeline for 
implementation and potential funding sources. We do think that what is important here is that you include implementation steps. Um, so so there, um, that's our recommendation with respect to that section. Um, so we have similar, um, a similar recommendation for section 12, which relates to uh, new neighborhood development areas. In um, section 15, which I'm not sure is a section that anyone else will touch on, but it, uh, put in place a mechanism for municipalities permitting um, wastewater treatment facility connections and uh, water supply connections. Municipalities do that today. The state also, the Agency of Natural Resources also um, issues those permits. So if you're a developer, you have to get a permit from both ANR and from the town. Those permits essentially say the same thing. And so the section 15 was uh, proposed to, um, to delete the, the Agency of Natural Resources permit. And we have um, language that's in my testimony that was agreed to um, between the Agencies of Natural Resources, Commerce and Community Development and the League of Cities and Towns uh, way back when before COVID-19. BC 19 and um, for some reason, which I'm not really sure why um, that language was not incorporated in S237 and we would ask that you do that. And, we, and that's really, um, is that right? That, that's the, um, the sum of our suggestions for amendment to the bill. Thank okay. you very much for taking the time. Great. Thanks for um, participating and getting those suggestions in writing too. That will be helpful for us. Um, and just by way of sharing information, our, our last <laughs> witness of the day is um, Michael Grady, who's uh, done some work with ANR on the wastewater um, provisions since this bill left 237. So we should be um, looking at new language and so please keep your eye open for that and see if it addresses your concerns that you were just sharing with us. And I'll do okay. this. I'll do the same. We'll all, we'll all keep our eyes on all these pieces. Right. Um, any committee questions for Ms. Horn? Okay. Well, thank you for uh, joining us. So now I'd like to uh, turn to uh, uh, Ms. Byer, Kathy Byer. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for joining us today. Sure, sure. And so can you, um, since we don't, this committee doesn't see you uh, quite as regularly as some committees maybe, if you can um, reintroduce yourself just briefly and say what particular perspective you're bringing to us today on whose behalf you're speaking. Sure, happy to do that. Um, uh, my name is Kathy Beyer. I'm the Vice President for Real Estate Development at Housing Vermont. Housing Vermont is a nonprofit housing developer that works across the state. We've developed over 5,000 units of affordable housing. Um, and I'm, uh, I was invited through um, our membership with the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, so my comments are very much um, related to Jen Holler's comments around the affordable housing components in S237. And um, you know, my experience is um, that we have benefited greatly from the pri Priority Housing Project Exemption in Act 250. Um, that is, has been a tool that has helped us um, be able to build in communities and in fact, often build in partnership with private developers um, because of the attraction of the exemption from Act 250 when you meet that definition. Uh, we also support the concept of exempting all properties in designated downtowns and NDAs from Act 250. As um, Karen Horn indicated, those designation processes involve a lot of planning. Um, those are exactly where we want to be building. So um, we, 
I think the concept is a good one. It just had the um, unintended consequence of getting rid of this concept of a priority housing project. So um, that's why we think it's important to have this affordable housing language inserted into the renewal or um, new, new designation process. Um, and I just wanna um, take a minute and reflect with you about my experience as a housing developer, which I've been doing for years in Vermont. Um, and one thing I think people don't realize is it is very difficult to find land um, with town water and sewer and the adequate zoning that allows for the density of multifamily housing in our communities across the state. Um, in the town of Brattleboro, I, I um, was looking for land that could handle um, 20 to 25 units and I looked for two years. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to find. And in fact, you are competing with developers who might wanna do um, higher end housing. So um, the designated downtowns and NDAs are exactly where we want to build. Um, and we also know, and I think that's become even more apparent after, a, uh, after going through um, this pandemic that a successful community is one that has a wide range of um, housing for all income levels. And we, um, we don't want to, um, we, as, as a, as a unintended consequence of exempting all properties in uh, designated downtowns and NDAs from Act 250, we wouldn't want the unintended consequence of losing um, our leverage to also build affordable housing. So um, that's why we think it's important to keep this language in. And um, I just wanna make one comment uh, about housing commissions. Karen Horn mentioned the housing commissions and um, there are only a handful of communities that have housing commissions right now. And I can tell you it is extremely helpful when we go into a community and start the permitting process because those housing commissions show up at the development review board and tell people why this housing is needed in that community. And that never happens. It's, um, it's a really useful tool. It's only one of the listed tools um, in section 10 of the bill, but I, I, I just wanted to make a pitch for um, communities, to encouraging communities to have housing commissions. I think every community has a conservation commi commission, um, but we need to make a little more progress on housing commissions and communities. Thank you. Uh, great. Welcome former colleague. Thank you. Um, so the draft nine one then, you're not asking for any changes, you're just basically supporting what the, the language we have there currently. Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a, a question. Um, there is a provision in the bill related to um, requiring the allowance of smaller lot sizes. And so I, I'm just, uh, in terms of, if I'm asking for a little education here, how often are you engaged in subdividing, uh, creating new lots off of whatever it might be sort of a quote unquote big yard or something like that uh, to infill versus developing uh, you know, an entire lot that's much bigger than an eighth of an acre. I don't know the, the role of sort of infill versus either redevelopment or finding uh, land that's not developed at all. Right, for multifamily development, that's not as critical, but what I would say is, um, reflecting back on my comment, that it's so difficult to find land on town, water, and sewer. So we have a lot of land that is sitting there on a large lot for a single family home. And it, to me, it makes total sense to try to um, find more ways to get more housing on that land. Okay, and um, I, that does make sense. And I guess I have a quick question too, um, not to go too far down this path, but um, to what degree do you feel like it should be a state mandate to set kind of, oh, I'm getting some help. Ooh, state mandate. <laughs> that dog knows when to talk. <laughs> no, no comments for seven hours, but once the committee goes, um, <laughs> the uh, 
the question is sort of like a local control question. To what degree would we set state um, minimum lot size, sorry, uh, a, re a new minimum for lot size at the state level versus just allowing a, a municipality to decide for itself. I, I I honestly don't think I can comment on that. I haven't spent enough time on that portion of the bill. No. Okay. I, tr I trust your deliberations on that. Right. Okay. Um, any um, committee questions for uh, Ms. Byer? Okay. Thank you. So Senator McDonald said former colleague. So did you serve in the legislature? A long time ago. A long time ago. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you again for joining us. Um, then I'd like to move on to um, Alex Weingarten. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, Senator Bray. Uh, and it's Weinhagen. Just oh, sorry. Know. Thank okay. you. Thanks for the correction. So and, I'll introduce myself and, and just dive in if that's okay. Yes, please. And I don't know if people know on whose behalf you're speaking today either. Thank you. So I'll clarify that. Um, I do wear two hats. So my name is Alex Weinhagen. Uh, I'm the legislative liaison for the Vermont Planners Association. Uh, and we are a professional association of over 150 planners across the state of Vermont. We are a section of the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association. Um, and our focus is on education and professional development, but we also have um, interest in legislative policy. And so we try to help the uh, uh, committees like yours when we can um, and bring the expertise from our membership um, to your service. Um, I also serve as the director of planning and zoning, my day job uh, for the town of Heinsburg, and I've been there for 18 years. So I have some experience with um, municipal planning and development review. So we submitted um, uh, 11 recommendations for improving uh, S-237. We, we're very much in support of the bill, uh, especially the overall objectives, the housing objectives. Um, so we want to we want to be on record first saying we, we very much support the bill and appreciate the work on it. Um, uh, at the same time, we do feel like it could be improved, and that's the that's why we provided um, uh, these eleven recommendations. Uh, you'll notice in the written testimony that some of those recommendations have to do actually with H nine twenty six, the Comprehensive Act two fifty reform bill. Um, and that's because we understand that you're discussing pulling portions of H-926 into S-237 to create a more balanced bill, which we do support. Um, I, I, I do want to just preface my specific comments on S-237 by saying that as an organization, we worked really hard uh, with the Commission on Act 250 and the House Natural Resources Committee to, to, to come up with a comprehensive Act 250 reform bill, uh, which H926 is, uh, embodies. Um, and so we're, we're very um, uh, concerned that uh, by cherry picking portions of H926 and placing them in S237, we might lose momentum in seeing action on comprehensive Act 250 reform in the next session. And we would encourage you to to not let that happen, um, to make sure that whatever positive things can happen in S-237 um, doesn't uh, stop us from continuing the work that needs to happen on a more comprehensive Act 250 reform package next year. So um, I'll just highlight a couple of the comments that we made. Uh, it's several pages worth. Um, and so I don't wanna belabor all of the points. Uh, you can read them in the written testimony. Um, we do feel as Karen Horn mentioned that section two is particularly problematic. Um, and we think that the entire section should be stricken uh, with the exception of the good work that was done on the accessory dwelling unit provisions. Um, as <coughs> Senator Sorotkin indicated in his testimony to your committee, um, that's a really logical improvement to and clarification to the state's accessory dwelling unit provisions. And we, we fully support those. Um, my own community of Heinsburg made changes like that um, several years ago, uh, the city of Burlington made similar changes more recently. Other communities have been, have been, um, providing some leadership on that front and taking that statewide makes a lot of sense. However, the other, uh, mandates that are in section two are, are extremely problematic. And, um, we feel that, uh, 
rather than uh, mandate provisions that don't actually address the issue at hand. Minimum lot size, for example, is not what provides affordable housing. Density is what provides affordable housing. That if there are going to be changes to chapter 117 and new mandates, some of which might make sense, particularly related to um, regulation of duplexes at the municipal level, uh, that we have a more considered conversation about that uh, and, and actually tackle the items from a, from a regulatory standpoint that will have the, the greatest effect and not have the unintended consequences that we feel this will, uh, particularly in relationship to water and sewer areas, which um, from a local planning level do not equate to areas where we have, uh, that are destined for more dense development. Um, as Chris Cochran can tell you, the designation programs focus on the areas that we have planned for growth. And just because an area is served by water and sewer does not mean that it is in a village center, a, a designated downtown or a neighborhood development area. Um, in my community of Heinsburg, we have a, a a small water and sewer service area compared to the overall uh, town, but that water and sewer service area um, is large enough that it includes areas that we are not planning to have dense development in. And we extended water for the purposes of, of public health for serving um, three of our mobile home parks um, and sewer to help serve industry, um, not, to, not to sprawl outside of our, of our actual village growth area. So, um, one size fits all approach that's in section two with regard to minimum lot sizes uh, in areas served by water and sewer is a bad idea. Um, and that's why we recommend that you strike most of section two. Section eight deals with um, uh, Act 250 condition transfer and removal. Um, so as you know, this bill does a very positive thing in providing exemptions within designated downtowns and neighborhood development areas. We would suggest that uh, extending that to enhanced village centers would also make sense. But the, the way in which it transfers conditions on existing Act 250 permits in those areas um, to appropriate municipal panels is flawed. Um, and we would suggest that a different mechanism needs to happen than what's proposed in the bill. Uh, frankly, the cleanest way to deal with these legacy Act 250 permits once, uh, once uh, projects in downtown areas are no longer under jurisdiction is to simply extinguish the permits and allow for proper development review at the municipal level and not worry about those legacy conditions. But if there's a desire to respect some of those conditions because of agreements with neighbors or, or what have you, then it's really the district commission's role to make those decisions and figure out how those conditions will carry forward. It's not the role of a municipal development review board that never created those, position, those conditions and, and, and the municipality that may not have regulations that would support uh, the imposition of those conditions or the enforcement of those conditions. So those, um, uh, some retooling needs to happen in section eight for those reasons, we believe. Um, moving on quickly, um, you've talked about some provisions from H926 that you'd like to bring into S237 to make it a more balanced package. Um, one of those is adding criteria to Act 250 related to forest blocks and habitat connectors. Uh, we fully support that. We feel that's an important uh, improvement and, and is a good part of, of the Act 250 reform effort. Um, however, we're concerned that the definition of forest blocks that's in H926 is overly broad. And as the testimony you received from Jamie Fidel and Brian Shoup from VNRC last week indicate, the objective behind adding these criteria is to protect large and intact uh, forest areas. It's not to uh, require Act 250 review or require a discussion during an Act 250 review under that criteria of small patches of trees, small patches of forest. And, and so S165 that you've had some discussion about um, has a different definition of forest block that does refer to a particularly mapped resource of interior forest areas. And we feel that might be a better, uh, a better definition to use if you were to bring that in. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, yes, Senator, you're, you're, I'll just go ahead. 
Uh, I so it. if I may, um, tell me what exactly you mean by the, the mapped, give me a definition of what exactly you're, you're referring to that you'd like with regard to mapping. So in general, uh, yeah. BPA and planners across the state believe in mapping and believe that important resources, whether they're used for jurisdictional decisions in Act 250 or criteria review in Act 250, ought to be based on uh, a, a map that's been vetted and is scientifically sound. And for the purposes of a forest block definition, um, the definition in S-165 refers to a specific data set um, that was created and that can be improved and vetted. And, and that's an interior forest um, mapping uh, resource uh, that is, does not include every scrap of trees, but buffers uh, house sites, roads, and other developed areas by a certain distance so that it focuses on, on larger intact forest blocks and not every patch of trees as the, like the ones you can see in the picture behind my head. Right, but don't we want this to be, I mean, ANR wanted the definition of forest uh, criteria to be broad. Doesn't it make more sense for it to be broad? It can be broad as long as it is um, scientifically based and, and, and a mappable data set. Uh, and again, the, the level of broadness in the, in the definition in H926 is just, is just over uh, over the top. There's too, it's, it includes too much forest. Well, don't you think rulemaking will take care of the forest block definition, you know, really help us through this process? Uh, so rulemaking could help. Um, yep. We definitely feel that uh, resource mapping and vetting of those, of those maps is the best step forward. And so uh, we would encourage that to happen. And, and through a rulemaking process, perhaps it could. But, but we do feel that uh, especially at the regional planning level, there are resources that can be brought to bear to uh, improve uh, those kinds of maps. And whether that happens through a rulemaking process um, or, or some sort of delayed implementation of this provision, once we have suitable data, I, either of those might be possible. Thanks. So one possibility on this is, um, just as Senator Campion was alluding to, the, the use of the maps as part of a uh, rulemaking process to bring a greater level of specificity and nuance to the work. But the road rule is the triggering device and then the attraction of that was, well, one, we used it for 26 years, rather, you know, uh, it has a hit, we have some history with it, um, which you may or may not think was good history or bad history, I'm happy to hear that. But it's also, it does have the advantage of being, uh, a clear quantifiable measurement that can be used um, to sort of open the, the door into discussion. The rulemaking can add in the, um, the nuance again of the, the map making piece. My understanding is in part that um, the maps weren't developed with the intent of being used in a regulatory manner. So, um, there's some questions around that have been raised to me about their suitability for that as a, a regulatory, uh, as data for regulation. <laughs> I mean, I agree. I think that also the commissioner can figure out the forest blocks. Um, and since rulemaking is required in this bill, I, I think we're okay. But um, so I, I respectfully disagree. The definition of forest block will drive uh, what happens through any sort of rulemaking process. And if the definition is as it stands in, uh, in uh, H926, um, it, it means everything. It means every, every contiguous patch of forest. Um, and so some, some boundaries on that uh, to, to make sure that it meets the legislative intent, which is large intact forest blocks. Um, I think is, is appropriate to insert into the definition at the statutory level and then allow the specifics to be worked out through mapping um, and through whatever rulemaking needs to happen. But the basic definition does not line up with the objective of the bill. And, th and that's what we're pointing out with regard to the definition of forest blocks. And that's why we thought the definition in S-165 uh, might be more preferable. Regarding the jurisdictional trigger, which is an important point um, that you raised, Senator Bray, um, 
we've listened to the testimony that you received last week um, from VNRC regarding the road rule. Um, we're not in support of the road rule. Um, again, we'd like to emphasize that in order to meet the objectives of Act 250, um, we need to be able to make sure that jurisdictional decisions are based on actual impacts and not just the easiest uh, mechanism for getting a project into the Act 250 review process. Taken on its face, the road rule has nothing to do with the fragmentation of forest, right? I mean, it's about road lengths only. No. So, no. Well, I, I, no, 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 I don't no. agree with that. Yeah. But I'll well, let I mean, you just continue. Tell me why it doesn't have anything to do with fragmentation of forests. Because the actual language of the road rule doesn't mention forests, it mentions road lengths. It's all about having a development that creates 2,000 feet or more of roads and driveways. It doesn't mention where that development occurs. It doesn't say that it has to be impacts within a forested area. So for example, I have projects in my community uh, that over the last uh, 15 plus years uh, have been uh, subdivided. And these subdivisions may have been five or six lot subdivisions that in a community like Heinsberg that has zoning, uh, did not trigger Act 250. Um, those projects um, created roads and driveways that would have met this trigger, but did not impact forest resources. And therefore it, it begs the question, why would, we, why would we put them into jurisdictional review based on this, this criteria if the impacts they were having were minimal? So our suggestion is not that there shouldn't be jurisdictional expansion. We believe there should be to protect from forest fragmentation. But we feel that that should be based on the resource itself and, a, and mapping of that resource such that development can be judged. Are you impacting, impacting the resource? If you are, you should trigger Act 250 and be properly reviewed. The road rule is just a shortcut to try to get there. And sure, it will work in some situations, but it will also pull in a whole host of projects that don't need to be in front of the Act 250 uh, district commission. Well, so thank you. I mean, I think uh, I, I'm sensing that this is maybe a, a bit of a false choice. I, I realize how you might think of it as too blunt an instrument. Um, uh, on the other hand, the there is we would I think anticipate bringing the kind of sophistication and nuance to the discussion through the rulemaking process. But I also ag agree with you here. We need things to be well defined at the outset, otherwise the rulemaking won't deliver the legislative intent. So, uh, that, and I think that's on us to make sure that we ask for rulemaking that um, sets us up for success. Uh, so. I'm wondering how many uh, 2000 feet roads are in Hinesburg? So it's not a matter of just the roads. It's a matter uh -huh. of the driveways that come off of those roads. So it's the sum total of those two. Um, I can tell you that 2,000 feet- A developer feet is like that is not thinking about smart growth, I don't think, but- hey, it, It's like two tenths of a mile. It's not that long. So, so Senator Campion, I don't disagree with you that minimizing road lengths is a good idea and that developers <laughs> will do that in order to avoid tripping this <clears throat> jurisdictional trigger. But at the same time, I, I also understand the history of the 800 foot road rule when it was the case prior to it being eliminated. And what was swept up in that um, were projects that did not need to be an Act 250 review. And, and those projects are in it forever now until there can be some sort of jurisdictional release, which is another suggestion that we're offering in the written testimony. Um, so, Again, our, what I'm advocating for is not that we do not protect forest blocks and, and attack forest, we should. This is, this is a, a, an unfortunate shortcut to try to do that. And a better way from a planning perspective is to map the resource we care about and then, and then judge developments based on their impacts to that resource. And perhaps it's still a road rule at that point, but it would be a, a rule that would reflect impact to a mapped resource. And we use those resources all the time in Vermont, both at the local level and at the Act 250 level. And sure, many of them have um, some accuracy issues and that's why we work to improve them with the agency 
and also make sure that there's on the ground vetting when a specific project is in front of a district coordinator for a jurisdictional decision. So it, I, I think we can, we can have, the, we have data that we can use, we can improve that data and we can actually have legislation that enables us to protect the resource we want and, and not take shortcuts that, that will capture unnecessary projects. Yeah. Um, what is, so, you know, I, in a way, uh, I guess what I'm going to ask is if uh, this trigger, the road rule is a trigger that you think sort of rounds up rather than rounds down, captures potentially too many projects. Um, and by the way, so 2,000 feet is 0.38 miles, so almost four tenths. It's not, it's a significant amount of road, but uh, how significant, others can, will judge. But sweeping someone, a project into Act 250, um, given how well it served the state, I'm always surprised when people sound as though the, one of their goals is to avoid getting into Act 250. When I think of proper, good planning is the beginning of good development. So I'm sure that's not your intent, but why is, what's the sort of motivation to, to try to avoid Act 250 for a project with 2000 feet of road? It's a good question. Um, so to be clear, VPA and m most of the planners I know across the state very much support Act 250 and believe the review is positive. But I think we also believe that Act 250 is designed to review a certain scale of development. It's not designed to review a property owner's uh, plans to place a garage on their six acre lot that may have an impact to um, some woods that's within, within that property. It's designed as the original triggers um, indicate for larger development projects. And, and so it's not that people should be afraid about going into Act 250, but that Act 250 should be used to achieve, to achieve the objectives that it was set out to. Um, and there are plenty of smaller level projects that simply don't warrant Act 250 review. From a perception standpoint, Senator Bray, I think you need to understand that there is a perception across the state, not in the planning community per se, but in the people that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, that Act 250 is something to be avoided, that it is costly, that it can involve appeals, and that people have a level of fear of that of that permitting process. Now, well, that's a, you're, now you're getting into, you know, how are we marketing and educating people about Act 250? I mean, perception, sure, perception's one thing, but let's deal in fact and reality. We've had good conversations with the chair of the Natural Resources Board about what's actually happening on the ground. Um, so let's just stick to the facts and not people's perceptions at this point. Well, I was merely responding to Senator Spray's um, question about why would there be um, that feeling about Worry, worry about entering an Act 250 review process. And I'm just telling you, it's, it's, a, it's a real feeling out there in the communities that we work in, especially the rural communities um, that aren't seeing uh, city-sized development projects, which everybody agrees should be an Act 250 review, um, but wonder about it when a small uh, commercial operation um, tries to open and, and goes through an Act 250 review process so I'm just saying that when we set jurisdictional triggers, we should be cognizant of making sure that, that what we are capturing uh, matters and that it actually uh, deserves review and, and that we will, we will capture the impacts and mitigate them that are important. A 2000 foot, foot uh, road rule is easily uh, worked around like, like a lot of you know, jurisdictional triggers. Um, I can think of one particular project in my town where we had a single family home on an existing lot that punched a very long driveway into intact core forest. And, and it was very unfortunate. Um, but in that case, it would have been very easy for that property owner to simply make a 1,900 foot driveway instead of a 2,000 foot driveway. And, and so by mapping a resource and saying, no, no, it's not the length of road that gets you into Act 250, it's whether you are impacting the resource we care about that gets you into Act 250. It's a, it's a much better way to deal with a jurisdictional decision. Right. Okay, well, thank you for that. I think I, I still, um, 
think that we can, uh, we, I don't want this to be set up as a false choice. There could be a trigger that brings you into a process that has the level of uh, mapping data used and analyzed to um, determine what your experience in Act 250 would be like. Yeah. So we can distinguish projects that need a lighter review versus a, a, a deeper review because of forced impact. So I appreciate the, uh, we, all, we are, fans of good data in this committee. I guess a concern I have is, as it's been expressed to me, is that the mapping data is not um, fully developed statewide. And so it's a resource that we can't count on alone for making these kinds of distinctions. So it may be that uh, Chittenden County is ahead of the curve. I'm not, I don't know one way or the other. If your RPC has been particularly um, you know, sort of forward thinking on getting all the mapping done. All right, so are there any more um, committee questions for Mr. Weinhagen? Okay, I don't see any. Um, thank you for your testimony and for your written testimony. It's very helpful to get uh, details. I know that you were alluding to our, the bill we had uh, S-165 and on force blocks. So um, I'd ask you a favor, just so that I don't guess as to what piece of that that you prefer over the construct in um, 926, uh, if you could call it out to me and, and send it to the committee, then we'll know precisely uh, what language you're seeing and as preferable. Sure, it is simply the forest block definition, but I'm happy to forward that. Okay. Great, thank you. It's a belt and suspender thing this time of year to get things in writing in more than one place. Thanks so much. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to turn to Commissioner Walk, who, there he is. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. Um, I, for the record, Peter Walk, Commissioner of the DEC. Um, I, at this point, I don't have any specific testimony um, other than to um, to um, to be listen and be a resource as you walk through this testimony. Okay, Peter, great. I do have a quick question then for you, um, and that is, can you just uh, share a little information with the committee about the mapping data that we've been referring to off and on in the last two weeks? You know how um, I don't. I know it's a deep topic, but can you just say something about uh, the, how complete the data set is and how it was developed and is it useful data to be referring to um, either for a jurisdictional trigger or to uh, as a data set to be referred to during a rulemaking process or an active 50 process. Um, so I, I don't, it'd be helpful for the committee to better understand what kind of tool that is and how it might be well deployed versus not so well used. Uh, I can begin that conversation, Senator, but you really ought to have uh, Commissioner Porter in here if you want that detailed information as it's his team that has developed that data set. Okay. Um, it's part of the Vermont conservation design process, which as you've heard was not intended to provide uh, a to, to be used in the, for the purposes of regulation because it is a uh, the the granularity of of that data is pretty it's you know it's a pretty wide view um, you know the idea that we would get down to the specificity of of a of the sort of individual case by case basis was never anticipated it was designed to provide that sort of here are the, the major areas of intact forest blocks and connectivity habitat. Right. Um, and that is that is the sort of the, the its its purpose and intent. Um, if if you're going to use it as a mapped as a as a resource in order to establish jurisdiction, uh, the level of fidelity would need to be significantly different. Um, as as we've seen with other mapped resources. Uh, there are not necessarily, maps are a static viewpoint. 
uh, of, of something. If we look at the wetlands mapping, for instance, the level of resources that would be needed to maintain those, uh, those maps due to the changing nature of the resource prevents uh, that from being the, the complete uh, necessary trigger. Um, so if you want more detail, and I, if, if it sounds like you do, you really need Commissioner Porter in here to, to provide you with that level of detail. Okay, great. Thanks for that helpful jump start. Um, and Commissioner Porter is going to be in tomorrow um, on the migratory bird bill piece. Uh, so we'll have a chance to ask him about it then. Uh, Senator Campion. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have to step out for a moment. But um, I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I walked in late uh, to the commissioner's testimony. But part of what I grabbed at the end of your testimony, Senator, your comments, Senator Bray and uh, uh, Commissioner Walk, is that, you know, in part, if, we, if we're mapping and mapping and mapping, I feel like in a way we're not going to get everything that we need um, to have done actually finished. I think maybe that was more of what you were saying before Commissioner Walk jumped in, Senator Bray. Uh, so I'm not quite sure I'm following you. If we're, what's the concern again? Well, Wait. part of, you know, I think, you know, if, if we wait, you know, for all the data on mapping, then we're not going to be able to do the protect the necessary protections that we actually need, or we're not going to be able to do them as quickly and efficiently. Um, but it makes sense because, I mean, I'm struggling with this. I think the road rule has a lot of questions, and I'm still trying to understand why we got rid of it, what, 10 or 15 years ago. Would we be better off making this? part of the bill into some kind of a study committee or task force to come back with a proposal next year. Oh, I'm all for putting the road rule back in. I'm sorry, just around the mapping piece. Um, right, but I, I think there are a lot of questions on the road rule that I think could put this entire bill in jeopardy um, from having enough support through the process, even at the, the, you know, the administration's raised significant concerns. You've got uh, legislative council that's you know raised some questions. I just think, and you know, if we were in the building and working like we normally do, we might be able to work through it in the next couple of weeks. I just don't know if we can through this kind of work method. So I think looking at possibly you know reducing that into um, a study committee or something we can look at during the off season and come back next year and examine in full capacity um, might be. The best way to go on this front, I think, include mapping and stuff into that. I can uh, respect uh, Senator Karen's uh, opinion. I, I'm not there. I think you can go ahead personally uh, and do it. I didn't mean to just uh, raise that one question um, in, in direct. I wasn't thinking about directing in that way. It was just a general question. Um, but as we're on the topic, I, I think we're personally, I, I think we're okay with moving forward, uh, putting the road, restoring the road rule. Um, I, I still have not heard personally, uh, reasons to proceed, uh, you know, as business as usual and, and not restore it. Uh, I haven't, don't see any reason not to. So, um, well, I'd still like to around. understand more why we got rid of it 15 years ago. <laughs> Perhaps the chair would take a straw poll on whether or not we wish to continue to head in this direction on this road. Okay. So um, thanks. I think, you know, one thing we, we I, I'd like to, so thank you, Senator Parent, for raising the question. I think that's a, a great question and we should, you know, better understand the answer. Um, the other thing too, by way of reassurance is that the bill contemplates rulemaking and there's a pretty long development timeline. So I think the, the, the mapping issues and the road rule issue, uh, there'll even be another legislative session that could come back in and make uh, adjustments. So um, I, I say that not to sort of invite sloppy thinking on our part now, which I don't think we are uh, getting involved in, but that we don't let, um, you know, sort of aiming for a perfect bill at this moment stop us from engaging in a process that will help us 
figure this out. So, um, so you know, I'm keeping an eye on the clock and uh, I wanna change the batting order up just a little bit because we have heard from, we will come back to uh, Mr. Hemrick and Mr. Cochran, but uh, Mr. Sawyer hasn't been with us before. And so I'd like to invite him to uh, join us next and then we'll double back to our colleagues at ACCD. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Bray. Um, I'm Chip Sawyer, Director of Planning and Development for the City of St. Albans. And um, in general, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a community with a designated downtown and a designated growth center, we, we wholeheartedly support the um, idea of allowing uh, communities with designated areas to use their rigorous planning processes to eliminate some of the permitting redundancies from both the state and local level. So exempting um, what we call an Act 250 exemption, what others might call um, a local assumption of some of the Act 250 concerns and standards, that might be another way of looking at it. Uh, you know, I think they're the optimal places to address these permitting redundancies um, for projects that would be subject to both Act 250 and local permits. Uh, others have already said that the designation process proves that we possess and we can augment the rigor of our planning and regulatory processes to consider statewide and regional concerns as well as issues of local context. Um, you know, as a city, you know, State Almond's ready for that responsibility. I know that there might be more things that come with it, obligations. Um, we might have to build some capacities that we don't have today, but in terms of economic development and building more housing in this state, if, if this sort of exemption can get us on the road there, then we're willing to be a partner in that process, including working through the intricacies of what we do when we're passing uh, an Act 250 permit off to a local jurisdiction, the standards and conditions that came with that Act 250 permit, whether or not the permit needs to be dissolved altogether, we're willing to be part of that process. And, and we know we could handle it at the local level to reduce that multiple permitting um, venue issue. Okay. Um, uh, can I, Mr. Sorry, quick question. So as you take on that, those duties, um, for instance, uh, mapping of, waste and water systems. I, and I don't know if that's something that uh, City of St. Albans has already done completely, so there's no new task there for you. Um, but I'm just thinking about uh, to what degree do we end up uh, shifting costs onto municipalities if we ask them to do the tasks related to becoming a designated downtown or are we helping towns gain that certification and supporting them, or is it uh, relatively costly for a municipality to step up to the level of planning and expertise in order to be able to pull that all off? You know, I think it depends on what rigor you're looking for. Um, you know, the city of St. Albans has, has, has very good water and wastewater system maps. We actually don't have a great process uh, for doing um, digital updates to those maps on the fly. You know, ideally every public works uh, staff member would have an iPad where they can mark when they've fixed a section of water line or updated a catch basin. Um, but I, I, would, I, would, I would follow up on Karen Horn's comments by saying two things. One is, I think we do need to determine, you know, if, if, if we're forcing communities to look for every single 150 year old water or sewer line that they can find, that would be hard. But I don't know if that's the degree of, of, I don't know if we need to be that fine to produce a resource that could be used for both local and state planning. And then the other thing I would say is, it, yes, it, it, you know, either way, it could be a, um, a significant cost for many municipalities. But when you recognize the fact that having these maps would not only be a local resource, but a regional resource and a state resource, you know, imagine if the state of Vermont could know where every water and sewer line was in the state. That, that's, that's worthy of state investment. And, you know, perhaps one of the answers to VLCT's concerns should be that the recognition that if we had a map of water and sewer lines in every community, that's not just a community good, that's a public good statewide, and it should um, include some sort of incentive, whether it be grants or whether it be direct funding, to make that mapping happen in the communities that need the assistance. Okay. Um, is there in general either fund, funding or technical assistance from the state as you 
folks further develop your local planning expertise? You no, know, I, I believe so. I believe that because uh, our cities use this uh, within the decade, but I believe if a community wanted to do some mapping of water and sewer and certainly stormwater infrastructure, they could write a grant to DEC. I'm, I'm sure one of their funding mechanisms would allow for that to be an eligible, eligible funded project. Of course, you know, it has to be competitive and you don't know whether or not you're gonna get funded, but I do believe the state does provide some of that financial assistance in a, in a manner of speaking right now. Sure, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I don't wanna ask too many questions and take you off your testimony. Are there things that you would, uh, are of concern, changes you would like to see in, nine, in uh, draft uh, nine one that we're working with? My, um, my, my real concern is the fact that there are many fundamentally beneficial things in S-237 and yet it's saddled with section two, um, which, which includes a lot of state mandates for local land use regulation that, that, are, that are sort of fly in the face of, of what's been a working partnership between the state and local communities, where the state identifies statewide planning goals and sometimes sets um, perhaps even uh, hard, hard, hard objectives you need to meet. Um, and then the communities come up with their local planning processes that devise solutions to meet those goals in our local context. For instance, there's a provision in chapter 117 that a community can't outright um, a prohibit multifamily housing. That's a good goal. It allows the community to decide though where multifamily housing uh, would be a good fit and where it might not be. The section two of 237 preempts our local planning processes by forcing fundamental changes in land use regulation without any public support. And we hear a lot about how minimum lot size is not the best way to regulate residential density, but it's still a central aspect of how we do it in our many communities. And section two would turn the legislature into the de facto planning commission for any community with water and wastewater service, which totally upends the planning processes set by state statute in chapter 117. You know, all of the city, the entire city of St. Albans is, has water and wastewater service. So section two would rewrite um, across the board um, a really fundamental piece of how we deal with uh, local land use regulation. We welcome housing in our community and we welcome change. Over the past decade, we've issued permits for more than 200 new housing units of all types, single family homes, duplexes, large multifamily projects. That's a significant number for our little city. I would, I would um, counter the argument that it's hard to find land in a city like ours to build housing. Um, we actually get involved in making sure developers can level the playing field in dealing with challenged properties. And I, I think that, um, Section two doesn't solve the sorts of problems we have with housing in our city and it would create more problems. We're directly involved in a public private partnership to build 63 new affordable and market rate housing units in our downtown. Housing Vermont's part of that. Uh, we've signed on to multiple VCDP funded projects for the Champlain Housing Trust and Housing Vermont to construct and stabilize affordable housing units all over our community. Um, section two is not what we need. Section two of S-237 is not what we need to make that easier in our community. Um, there's been a lot of talk of a stakeholder process that resulted in the provisions that got written into section two. Um, there was a state project underway called Zoning for Great Neighborhoods, um, engaged a lot of great multiple types of stakeholders into the question of why housing costs so much in our state. We all know there's an affordable housing crisis. The top votes went to construction and land costs. Permitting, process, permitting processes were also noted as a as a difficulty. I participated. We were told to expect some great recommendations for local communities like ours to consider. I'm still looking forward to these, but we weren't told that we should expect new legislation that would mandate fundamental changes to local land use regulations as part of the process. Um, I've consistently protested against the, taxes, the tactics of section two to both DHCD and to legislators, to the Economic Development Committee. Um, it kind of snuck in. I think that maybe um, we could have gotten our concerns out a little earlier, but um, we're here now and hoping that folks will listen to our concerns. Um, I would follow in the footsteps of Alex Weinhagen and the VPA um, 
advice that the clarification on ADUs to have that, I believe it's a 900 square foot minimum size. Uh, that works and I think that should remain. That is a clarification of an existing state mandate that already passed many years ago, but I don't think the additional mandates in section two should remain. I would suggest they be struck or sent and or sent to a study committee or substantially rewritten to include measurable goals that can be achieved with local planning solutions. Um, for instance, it could be rewritten to mandate that communities with water and wastewater service need to achieve a certain average allowed density of dwelling units amongst all their various different land use districts. Let them work out how they achieve that, or that a certain percentage of regulated districts need to permit four unit projects by right, but not the entire community. Or that they need to effectively reduce minimum parking requirements by a certain amount. Um, you could give us some hard percentage or relative numbers that we need to meet, but let um, the communities decide the details of, of how they meet these steps forward for providing more affordable housing around our state without um, passing these um, community-wide cookie cutter changes to minimum lot sizes and, and things like that. Um, that's the extent of my comments at the moment. Okay, uh, Senator Perrin. Sure. Chip, you know, I've, I've been obviously you and I've been talking about this, but you know, in my mind, I'm thinking about it too. And I, I like your idea of, of the average, um, you know, density across the community. Because I look at, you know, the way the rule currently written is say, I own an acre in St. Albans City, I could build, you know, eight duplexes on it. Well, it might be more cost effective and better for the community if I can build 16 units in one building, but then it becomes, you still trigger a lot of these development things where, you know, you, I would look at it and I'm sure you guys would look at it very similarly that 16 units on acres, 16 units on acre, we want to make it look the best we can if it, if it's pliable. So, um, I, I, Ellen and I have been going back and forth, but I was hoping to get you on here to kind of tease out some of those ideas, but would you be more supportive if we kept a section two, but in, and I know you kind of already answered, but I just want to clarify, um, if we went more along those lines, I'm trying to find that way that gets where Senate Economic Development wanted to go and where right. a lot of stakeholders want to go, but give you the ability to put that local flavor on it. You know, right. what works for St. Albans, because what works for us here in St. Albans is different than what's going to work for Senator Campion in Bennington or, you know, uh, Senator Bray in Middlebury. We all have different feels to our community and where we want development. The thing that made me think of the average solution is that, you know, we have in the center part of our city, we actually have some zones where if you're building above the, the first floor, there are no limits to how many dwelling units you can build. Uh, then we have neighborhoods with, with lots that are an eighth of an acre in size. And there are infill opportunities there to do more. Um, and then there are um, less dense neighborhoods where the requirements of section two would actually just result in the chopping up of historic homes. Um, we're working actually, our planning commission and our administration in our city are working on a program to allow bonus densities of dwelling units when you rehabilitate large homes, especially historic homes. We want, we do want to increase uh, dwelling unit densities in our city, but when you can pair it with something like a program like that, that accomplishes two public goods at the same time, that's even better. That's a solution that we've developed to issues that we have in our community. And I think that's more the flavor that section two of 237 should take is um, I understand the state and the legislators might want to see some real change. They might want to see some numbers that communities have to meet so that we know we're making forward motion in the affordable housing crisis. But these across the board cookie cutter minimum lot size mandates in section two aren't the way to do it. There's got to be, there's something in the middle between just saying, please allow more affordable housing to forcing this mandate. There's something in the middle about make some sort of percentage increase in terms of how much housing density is allowed in your community. You figure out where it is and how it's done. Um, but we, I think we can make that work instead. So, so Chip, you actually kind of got it there, but I want to clarify, how would we, do you think we should do a recommendation of a percentage increase in density or try to, because what the hard part I have is coming up, figuring out how we'd come up with a number in the legislature to say, 
you need to have this many units per acre or per square mile or you know whatever the density measure is um how how would that work you know if we're going to set a goal where we want to increase do you think we should say a 10 percent increase or a 15 versus this is the new number we'd like you to get to well you know in the absence of a lot of time we might just have to choose a number arbitrarily but that seems like what's already gone into section two is a lot of arbitrary numbers that i know are based on um you know situations in other parts of the country but uh you know, this is Vermont. I think we need something more homegrown. And I do think that, you know, I, I, what the section two already has a, uh, I believe a three year window before it becomes effective. You might be able to choose an arbitrary number now so that you're relatively assured you're gonna make some measurable progress. It could be uh, altered in, in the next biennium if we find out there's an issue with that number, or I think there does need to be a greater discussion overall between some before something as ambitious as Section Two does end up in legislation. I, I don't think it's quite ready for prime time. Um, I don't think it's ready to come out of the oven yet. It would I'd prefer to see this housing for great neighborhoods process be completed and to have some more conversation about that before we really start setting some hard targets. Um, well, thank you. You know, I, I think. In general, this committee has along and in a way that's compatible with what you're saying. I think repeatedly over the years, we have chosen to set performance targets and then we uh, invite communities to figure out how to get there as opposed to prescribing the pathway there. We set the target and then because things vary physically and all the rest so widely around the state, um, so it's good food for thought, thanks. And, and thanks for proposing an alternative, not just saying pitch uh, section two overboard. Uh, it's always good to hear another way of how we might get there. Okay. Um, if you don't have anything else, again, I keep my eye on the clock. I know we're a little pressed for time. I wanna keep us moving. Um, so, I'm, I suppose I would say, uh, because we heard from uh, Mr. Hemrick and Mr. Cochran before, this is sort of like a time for rebuttal or something like that. I don't want to turn it into a debate, but you've heard a lot of testimony since you first spoke to us. Any thoughts you want to share with the committee at this point? Um, can you hear me? Um, yeah, Chris Cochran for the record for the Department of Housing Community community development. Um, I would mention, I have a lot of respect for, for Chip. He is a member of our downtown development board and he always comes with creative ideas and solutions. Um, that said, you know, land use change and affordable housing is a never an easy proposition. Um, it's always controversial. Um, kind of, we went into this conversation, into this process knowing um, that, um, um, that we would get some pushback. Um, and this is why we consulted with you know, CNU, the Congress for the New Urbanism and a national smart growth expert. We consulted with um, experts from Oregon on ADU statutes and provisions. We worked with sister agencies and departments uh, and got their input. We engaged with mayors, um, local and regional planners, policy advocates in the state house, everybody from you know, VNRC to the Chamber of Commerce. Um, you know, it, 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 they're never easy, and striking that right balance is is a difficult job, and 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 one that I think you are well positioned to do, and you've done before. Um, you know, the land use section two is one piece of it, but if you add kind of the old Act Two Fifty conversation on top of that, the bill represents at least three years worth of kind of careful work and and, and compromise, and. Um, you know, if the committee needs to make changes to it, I just, I, I, I urge them to be judicious in their approach. I, I do think we have an affordable housing crisis and these changes combined with additional funding that comes with the CARE Act will ensure that we get housing in the right location in a more affordable way. And with that, I think I will conclude. Okay, thank you. Can you fill us in a little bit? Uh, I'm, I don't think the committee's heard much about the, I don't know if I caught the phrase right, like joining for great neighborhoods, is that what it was? Yeah, it's a, it's a project we um, worked on, you know, um, 
briefly, um, big thanks to um, VHCB, um, AARP, and the Vermont Realtors Association. You know, we, we rarely have money to do anything creative, um, but they helped us um, with some funding to hire a national consultant to say, you know, let's look at our neighborhoods and how can we make changes to create, you know, more housing opportunities within and around our centers. Our housing demographics are changing dramatically in our state. We, family sizes are getting smaller. People want smaller units, they need smaller units. And how do we make that happen on the ground? Um, we are in the process of finishing up that project. It is gonna come up with some guidance for communities um, to make incremental changes. Um, to, to, to find ways to find more housing opportunities in their communities. Okay. Um, is there a flaw with the notion of expressing um, performance uh, targets rather than the mechanism for achieving those performance targets? You know, basically what we were just talking about with Mr. Sawyer. Yeah, I mean, just all, you know, it's wherever you set the line. It's like any regulation. It's, 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 Picking that number is the challenge. Um, yep. Yep. Okay. And can you say a little more about uh, what will happen in the next three years? I mean, I don't think it's a little so that we know how this mm -hmm. bill will actually play out in the real world if it were passed yeah. just the way it is, for instance. Yeah. So communities have you know three years to work on this. Um, we're going to provide guidance and assistance. The initial bill had funding for regional planning commissions and an increase for municipal planning grants to help communities make this transition. Um, if communities find for some reason they have a, a constraint, you know, be it anything from, um, you know, we don't have the water wastewater capacity to support that kind of density, or we don't have, you know, this will impact our schools in a negative way. They were to file a capacity constraint report with the department. And with that, um, they were not required to meet these um, requirements. Okay, it's an offering of sorts. Exactly, and that's uh, something that we worked on. There's an offering the, the league door to it. Correct. You have to demonstrate yeah. the the problem. You can't claim there's a problem alone. Yeah, yeah, and to be completely frank, the the off the the standards for the off ramp were not rigorous. Um, this was to get communities thinking about ways that they can create more housing opportunities within their centers. Um, you know, honestly, if a community really wanted to push back and they didn't want to do it, they could file a report fairly easily. Um, but a lot of communities without the nudge and the push aren't going to make these, have these conversations. They're difficult. Um, sure. And then can, uh, can you say a little more about the, um, in terms of like technical assistance and funding that would mm -hmm. flow to municipalities that say, we're, we're on board, we want 10% more affordable housing in our, our mm -hmm. town, but what we're not quite so sure about is how we're gonna get there. Can they turn to you as a resource? And, and uh, Mr. Sawyer alluded to grant making, for instance, but can you say something about what kind of capacity is there to do that assistance? Okay. Capacity to help, yeah. Um, like, you know, we work closely with all of our regional planning commissions. Um, there was proposed additional funding in this bill that, that, that probes may have stripped out to augment their capacity to ensure easy implementation or easier implementation. And we we're also talking about increasing the municipal planning grants that go directly to municipalities to help them do that. Um, I think COVID probably dashed <laughs> the prospects for that funding. So it's something that you should consider. Right, okay. Oh yes, it's, it's casting a long shadow on a lot of worthy projects for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, any other questions from the committee to Mr. Cochran? All right, well, thank you for hanging in there with us and following us on this Absolutely. adventure. Absolutely, and thank you for taking this up. I know, you know, this is an incredibly compressed timeline and, and we really appreciate you looking at this and your efforts to kind of keep this moving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was saying this is like having all six burners going in the stove, and <laughs> I've noticed that all the chefs I've ever been around, they have no hair on their hands. It's all been burned <laughs> off. So um, with that, we're going to turn to river corridor provisions uh, in um, S-237, which we spoke very briefly about a long time ago before we left the State House to start working outside the State House. So Mr. Kowski, can you, uh, and Mr. Chapman is also here to help us, 
Um, can you walk us through the nature of the proposals and why they're being made? This is, you know, I would, this is like back to initial pitch. What, what's the reason for saying something about river corridors at all in the bill? And then how does this bill uh, address it? And I suppose I don't ask council to pitch a bill, right? So uh, I'll turn to Mr. Chapman who, uh, and ask from your point of view, what was the, the reason to be working on river corridor language at all? And uh, what's the strategy that the bill takes? And Does Matt, 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 do you want to answer that question? I, Chris might be able to answer that question also. Okay. Sure. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether you want to start by walking through the language itself or framing out why. I mean, there's, there's sort of two distinct components in here. One is to deal with sort of a historic, um, you know, oversight or um, uh, within the NDA designation and some of the challenges that it's pre presented to downtown development and, and frankly creating somewhat of an inconsistency with the way the Rivers program approaches uh, infill development in a previously developed area. Um, and so when trying to correct that historic issue and then also um, making modifications to the floodway floodplain criteria in Act 250 to basically make it consistent with almost 20 years of testimony by the agency before Act 250 um, around protecting river corridors and fluvial hazard erosion areas um, under the 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 quote unquote floodways criteria under Act 250. So again, bringing the language of the criteria up to date with sort of the modern interpretation of how we protect uh, river corridors and assets within, you know, prevent assets that for in those corridors. Okay. Um, I'm not recalling off the top of my head how, how long that section is. Um, Ellen, is that something, uh, Mr. Schakowsky, is that something we can walk through in the next five minutes and get a reasonable look at it? Um, we already took a look before, so this will be more of a refresher than starting from scratch. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think we necessarily need to talk about the specific language, but broadly, yep. S-237, draft 9.1, the same piece of legislation we've been working on that came out of Senate Economic Development made changes to the neighborhood development area um, requirements. So you recall from our broader discussion, we're proposing that neighborhood development areas and downtowns are exempt from Act 250, but we also impose a few additional requirements on those areas. And so we amend the requirement section in chapter 76A. So for neighborhood development areas currently, um, you are not allowed to include identified flood hazard and fluvial erosion areas in the area that is mapped as a neighborhood development area. Uh, areas that are mapped as neighborhood development areas receive quite a few um, benefits from being part of the program. So currently you're not allowed to include the flood hazard areas in your mapped area. But this bill proposes to um, allow for some for some areas for the neighborhood development area to include areas in the flood hazard and fluvial erosion areas containing pre-existing development and areas suitable for infill development as defined in the rules. So uh, you're now allowed to include those areas. Um, there is also a, a provision that extends further tax credits um, for qualified flood mitigation projects um, in those areas also. So that, that, that becomes part of the incentive package of being in one of these areas. Okay. So I'm reading right now and I'm seeing the new development is elevated or flood proofed at least two feet above base flood elevation. 
um, can someone who has experience with flooding and flooding levels, I mean, I don't know how, does that, would uh, Tropical Storm Irene have exceeded two feet above base flood elevation? And if I have to be specific in, in Waterbury or something like that. Is there any I other? don't know the answer to that. So, Senator, I, I can't answer the question about where Tropical Storm Irene ended up as far as base flood elevations, but, but estimated base flood elevations are kept by FEMA. And so people can go to FEMA maps and see what the base flood elevations are in order to determine what that, that, that sort of a term of art used by FEMA. Okay. Um, Senator, if I may, it's Peter Walk again. Um, yes, thank you. This, this language is consistent with how we regulate um, these types of issues in and around built environments, right? Because they're different than a uh, existing and intact uh, floodway, right? So we're, we're they're, they're by their nature different because they've already been constrained in some way, typically by previous development. We've armored banks, we've raised them, et cetera. And so it's a, it's a different path. You have testimony uh, provided, written testimony provided to you by Mike Klein, who ran our reverse program for many years, um, talking about the unintended consequences of excluding those areas explicitly from neighborhood development areas. Um, and, and testimony in support of providing this as a path to better, uh, to better align both the sort of ideas of, of infill development with our normal environmental regulations in place. And I would, I would recommend you refer to that if you have any questions. Um, Mike is obviously a recognized expert in the field and wrote this after his retirement and so with no affiliation with our organization. Right. Great, thank you for that reminder. I think actually we got my client's testimony, I don't know, 10 days ago. So um, I'll ask you to add it to our folder for today yep. so that uh, he, people- can He, he resent it to you recently, but the testimony is originally from March 5th. Yeah, yeah. Just... okay, great. Thanks for that reminder. All right, so uh, Ellen, if you can finish walking us through what the PowerPoint then um, yes, so, so we're talking about um, adding more areas that are allowed in the neighborhood development area. Um, there are incentives that come with that. Uh, the neighborhood development area also has to have adopted local bylaws um, around these areas also. And so then as I already sort of touched on, the bill expands the downtown and village center tax credit program uh, to, uh, first it extends it to neighborhood development areas. So now these areas are able to receive these tax credits, but there it also adds a new type of tax credit, which is for qualified flood mitigation projects. Um, and so here's the language for that. So we're structural and non-structural changes to a building located within a river corridor or flood hazard area are eligible for these tax credits. If that project reduces or eliminates flood damage to the building or its contents. Okay. And what would be an example of a non-structural change? Did someone, are we, are we being entirely literal if you're changing? framing versus you're changing siding. I don't know what we're pointing out, structural and non-structural. Anyone on the session today who can explain that one? Um, this is Chris Cochran. You know, you could change the grading in the yard. You could, you know, to reduce flood hazards, you can do, you know, reduce the elevation of fill. You know, there's lots of things that you could do that would reduce flood hazards. Okay, thank you. All right. So I think that covers the river corridor language in S-237. Okay, great. 
Great. So thank you. Uh, any committee questions for Team A and R or Council? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if Mr. O'Grady has come in. I see he has. There is so, quick, quickly, yeah. Senator Braid. There's one other provision yeah, that please. we have only sort of alluded to. The H926 bill contains an update to the definitions in Act 250 criterion 1D. Um, it changes the definition of floodway to flood hazard area and floodway fringe to river corridor, which matches ANR's language in uh, 752. Um, and it just uh, restructures that language to match ANR's current practice. Okay. That is not in S237 currently. You would need to add that if you want it. Okay. So, um, okay, so can you add that to your, the growing amendment that we, that we're working on with you, please? Sure. Thank you. All right, any other questions on the river quarter portion? All right, then here on our up-tempo tour of the bill, it's time to switch over to uh, municipal water and wastewater connections. Um, Mr. O'Grady, you have been working on some language with ANR. Um, if you could walk us through that, that's probably the most direct. You might want to maybe tee it back up for us, remind us of what we're doing and why, um, and and then show us the new language. Thank you. Sure. Uh uh, so under existing law, the connection of a new building or structure um, to an existing potable water supply or wastewater system requires a permit from A&R um, from their wastewater and potable water supply division. Uh, municipalities um, generally don't like this requirement because it's a, um, they don't think it's a significant um, action and they think that uh, it's an administrative burden for them to get the permit uh, or for the homeowner property owner to get the permit from ANR. A couple of years ago, what you did to address that issue was you gave the municipality the ability to get delegated to issue permits for connections. But apparently that is um, still too onerous for some municipalities. So what was proposed in S-237 was to give municipalities the ability to approve connections of buildings to existing uh, potable water supplies and wastewater systems if certain criteria were met. Um, I was asked to review S237's language. Um, since I had never seen it before, I had a lot of questions and um, and uh, and I think that document with all the, the your right and so, so was one of the last things we saw before we stopped working in the state house. I think right. Can you see my, my screen? Yes. Thank you. So, so these are the questions I had. Basically, why was it needed? Um, if it was going to go forward, it had to clarify that the delegation to municipalities was not going to apply or was not required for this approval. There were a ton of terms used where the meaning generally was not defined or the default meeting in Title I uh, would have cre created confusion. Um, then there were some things that needed clarity. Uh, if a municipality uh, was going to um, certify or basically state that it complied with the technical standards, who was going to issue the, that um, certification, that, that notice of approval? Was it going to be a professional year engineer or, or a licensed designer? Um, and what, what are these technical standards? Um, so I, I had a bunch of questions. Um, you asked me to uh, confer with the agency. I did. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Uh, so I proposed adding definitions of, of the terms that were uh, undefined in the language. I clarified 
the what the exemption was um, in section 14. I added that notwithstanding the delegation provision and notwithstanding the requirement to get a permit under title um, 10 1973, I clarified um, the control owner control provision. I clarified that the technical standards were a and R's rules and that the municipality needs to provide documentation in the land records from a professional engineer or a licensed designer that the connection was installed in accordance with the technical standards. Uh, and then I made some just minor changes to the study provision. Uh, Matt was good enough to, to look that over and confer with Brian and um, I'm not sure who else at the agency and they, they were good with it, but they wanted one additional change. They wanted in the 1983 section, the new section that allows municipalities to approve connections. They wanted the language on lines 12 through 14 upon request of the secretary and municipality approving the connection shall provide copies of approvals of connection, connection plans and any associated documentation. So that's, that's what it is. Um, it's really not changing the substance of what was originally proposed in 237. It's just proposing some um, clarifying language and definitions and okay. the, actually making it work. <laughs> Always something good. So this is right where we happen to be right now, notwithstanding 1973. So um, I'm trying to keep up here, uh, but so what do we need to not withstand if we're now providing an alternate mechanism for approval? Well, first you need to know, stand the fact that they need a permit, right? The statute requires them to have a permit for a connection. Okay. And then you have to not withstand that the way that municipalities can do it without a permit is through delegation because right. that's in statute too. Right. So, so you notwithstand the delegation, which is 1976, and you notwithstand the permit requirement, which um, actually 1976 is the permit, and 1976 the delegation, 1973 is the permit. You okay. notwithstand the both of them, and then you give the municipality the ability to approve that connection. Okay. Is there a reason we don't um, repeal 1976 and 1973? as opposed to not withstand them. Well, you don't want to repeat, well, repealing the requirement for a permit for a connection, that's, that's a policy decision. Um, uh, that's, th that uh, I think you're gonna have arguments on both sides on that. Yep. Um, yep. Repealing delegation, there might be a municipality that wants to be delegated to, um, but now with this authority, I'm not sure why a municipality would want to be delegated. Right. Okay. Um, well, yeah, and I'm not trying to expand the complexity of the task, but I was just thinking if we're notwithstanding the two other ways to be able to do something, why would we maintain them? But Mr. Chapman, do you have something you want to chip in? Well, sure. I'd happy, I'm happy to, to sort of flag. I think the two reasons why you would want to maintain those sections is one, with respect to the delegation, um, this is very focused on connections to a home from a wastewater treatment facility and a drinking water facility. Um, we also have two municipalities in the state who administer the on-site septic system. So they actually permit in ground on-site wastewater systems and they do that through a delegation agreement with the state. Connections to municipal wastewater treatment facilities and, and wastewater systems are, are relatively straightforward technical issues that, the, that don't have the sort of design components that the state feels the need to have a delegation agreement around. I think we're comfortable with giving municipalities the, the authority to, to issue those. Um, I think it would be much more, um, it, would be, it would be potentially more problematic to, to um, just sort of exempt that delegation authority. So I think the other, the other thing with respect to why do we need permits over these connections? I, so we're comfortable um, allowing municipalities to issue permits when both 
of wastewater and uh, drinking water are are connected to a municipal wastewater treatment facility or drinking water system. When you start blending those two, again, there starts to become more complex engineering issues that the state uh, either feels need to take place under a delegation agreement or alternatively, um, we need to continue having technical review over those those hookups. And I think the the um, the other thing is is that those those permits typically provide useful information to both the state and municipality around the design capacity and flows of individual homes to a wastewater or drinking water system that then helps us ensure appropriate engineering controls and other controls on the so that's that's sort of the the framework around some yeah. of this. In other words, as you keep approving permits, you're also adding up the total additional flow, for instance, to a wastewater treatment facility. Okay. Um, I would also think they provide a healthy, a helpful record for anyone who has to come back and uh, dig, maintain, fix, whatever. You have all that stuff. Um, so, um, and I take it then that the revised, the revisions that Mr. O'Grady's put together on behalf of the committee, uh, A&R supports, is that correct? We do, yes. I mean, I, I think, Mike, there are a lot of really great changes. I think it basically takes some of the uh, definitions that are in the rule and brings them into statute, which I think makes sense and, and then clarifies some of the things that could be ambiguous. So uh, I think it's a, a good amendment. Great, thank you. So then I would look to the committee to say, um, is the committee, uh, so this is yet another piece that we're assembling into our amendment. Is the committee support taking Mr. O'Grady's language we just walked through and we would I don't know if there's a handoff to Ms. Tchaikovsky but who's uh, uh, yes including it in this, this yes okay everyone set on that I'm not hearing any nays okay so then let's do that uh, thank you Mr. O'Grady for putting that together and working it through and Mr. Chapman as well um, yeah thanks to Matt Okay, so uh, this really completes the three topics that we had teed up for this morning. And um, tomorrow, just as a heads up, so we'll be revisiting Force Frag uh, again uh, and uh, hearing from a few uh, additional witnesses that missed out on earlier discussion. We also have had in the wings, no pun intended, no bad and pun intended, the migratory bird um, bill and had discussed whether or not that would be part of our Active 50 work. So if the, uh, we'll have a visit with David Mears and Commissioner Porter on that. Um, I think it's, I've heard nothing but positive things about making this step forward. So if that's something we can also include Seems so like you're that. thinking about incorporating that into the into everything, sending it as a part of the package. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, and there actually is a you know if you read through some of the documentation on it, tourism and birding are actually a significant economic uh, bit of economic activity for the state of Vermont. So there is a nexus between economic development and maintaining the natural resource that brings people. Here. Well, absolutely. The other thing also, I, I think at some point I'd like to have a conversation. Are we going to do anything with the tree warden bill? I mean, that was I'll, another conversation we may have had at one point to see if we might incorporate that into this as well as uh, part of the package. Yes. And I think probably Maybe we, you and I can talk offline. Um, it's another thing that's out there that I think seems like a worthwhile uh, item to include in this overall package. Right. Um, Yes, so exactly. It's, uh, it's a little bit like how, how big are our arms at the moment? So I'll follow up with you offline. Um, anyone who's on this meeting now, if you have feelings one way or the other about being able to bring the tree warden bill in, which was passed uh, by the House and referred to us, I don't know, maybe two, three weeks ago, um, but feel absolutely free. Please weigh in with me and the committee at large, and we'll keep that conversation going as well. We'll add a seventh burner to this sixth burner still. That's right. That's right. 
So, um, Andre, I, would, I would just encourage you to, while you're hearing from Commissioner Porter about the migratory bird bill, that yep. you also hear from him relative to your questions about uh, any number of topics that have come up as a result of this conversation, primarily around the forest fragmentation issue. Yep, great. Um, yeah, I have a highlighted note that while he's in to talk to us, um, let's ask about uh, the conservation maps and um, that piece as well. So we'll better understand those. Um, and I guess one quick, we, we're still actually a little ahead, amazingly enough. Um, Ms. Schakowsky, could you um, get for the committee access, maybe, uh, I don't know if it's just sending us a link or uh, connect us to that, the mapping resource that we keep referring to. Um, I don't think we've looked at it for two or three months now. So just for those who want to see that data, um, it would be helpful to have a link. As I recall, it's up on a website, right? I mean, it's in a, a state planning, an ANR database that uh, has a web front end so you can call up maps for any particular area. Does that sound correct? Uh, the ANR Natural Resource Atlas? Yeah, I'm not, you know, the maps that we're referring to as potentially useful to the forest fragmentation review. I, I'm not sure I know precisely where those maps are. And I thought it'd be helpful if, if you can send a link along to the committee so we could go look at these things before we have our next conversation. I may want to ask ANR to send that if we could, I, to make sure I know, I, I don't necessarily know if I know all of their resources. Um, Commissioner Watt, can you help us with that? Sure, I, what I will do is have Commissioner Porter in preparation for his testimony tomorrow provide you with some of the background information on those maps. Okay, great. If they can give us a running start, we'll be up to speed on uh, a little bit because I know tomorrow we'll also be pressed for time. We actually only have 90 minutes tomorrow. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for soldiering through. We had a lot of material today, very helpful review and um, of course, if people have more comments, don't be shy. Uh, we look forward to your correspondence. All right. And with that, we are adjourned for the day.